So ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna get we're gonna get going. And as we always do in the quarterly meetings, we always stand and salute the flag. If we could all stand, please. Flags over against the wall. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, first of all, I just want to thank each and every one of you. I just want to echo the sentiments of uh, Councilor Farwell. And before we begin tonight, I do want to uh, uh, express uh, that Shirley Azak, the Ward Council, just texted us. She's still under the weather. She has the flu. She will not be here tonight. Um, she said if anybody is here to talk about Walker's Playground, feel free to call her directly. Um, please also know Shirley filed the resolve with the Finance Committee, which was going to be heard on Monday, but she was sick then, so it's been continued. So there is a resolve that's pending before the Finance Committee relative to that specific item, uh, Walker's Playground. Um, so that, that's what Shirley wanted me to share with you before we began tonight. Um, again, I'm Bob Sullivan, a city councilor at large for the last, this is my 13th year. Um, and I just want to uh, thank you. These are great, um, you know, in the past, um, and we'll continue to do this, the four councils at large. We'll go to the, the middle schools. I still call them the junior highs because that's what they were for me. Uh, but we'll start at north and we'll hit east, we'll hit south, we'll hit west. And really the whole purpose uh, is for us to talk to you hear your concerns, your criticisms, suggestions. If you have any questions at all, it's, it's, that's what it is tonight. It's a QA. and a and when we finish, we finish. If we finish before 8, great. And if not, we'll cut it off at 8. And, you know, we're all accessible by email, phone, whatever it is. So, again, thank you tonight. I look forward to the evening. Thank you. In order of seniority? No, actually, give it to the newbie. The newbie. Oh, the newbie. Yeah. Yeah. The give it to Moses. Give it to Moses. Okay, well. give it to the newbie. Give it to Moses. <laughs> Oh, I'll take the mic. Look at us. No tie, tie, no tie, tie. So there you there go. There we go. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to I wanna echo the sentiments of uh, my colleagues here who basically, uh, uh, th we want to thank you for being out here. I mean, the weather's not the nicest thing out there. I mean, yesterday it was, what, 70-something, and today it decided to go into the 30s and snowing. So hey, it's New England for us. Uh, but it's a, it's a pleasure to, to be out here again. And as Bob said, we're going to try to do this as often as we possibly can because it's been our intentions to not hide away from the issues, uh, face it as, uh, as frontal as we possibly can. Uh, a lot of times there are decisions that are made uh, by us that you might not like, but you know what? Um, this is a large city and uh, we try to do the best we can for the vast majority of the citizens of this, uh, of this community. Uh, sometimes votes don't go our way. It happened. It has happened to me several times. Uh, but we like to um, to think that we're doing what's best for the citizens uh, of this uh, of this community, and we'll continue to do that. But again, as uh, as Bob said, our job here is just to listen, listen to uh, the worries that you have, and for us to take it back and try to figure out the best way to to answer your concerns, and we will continue to do that for as long as we're allowed to do. Uh, remember, we're, one, we're four of 11. Uh, in some instances, we're one out of the 11. Uh, it, it, it's a democracy. Uh, sometimes things go in a way that we don't feel is the appropriate uh, way to go, but again, we gotta respect the process. Uh, and we're here to make Brockton a better city for everybody. So thank you again for being here. And I, I certainly uh, echo my, my colleagues' comments. Uh, I'd first like to start off by saying to all of you uh, and to the people who may watch this at home, thank you for giving me your vote and giving me the honor of serving you for another two years. The cynics might think that we, we do this for political reasons. We actually enjoy it. I know that that may sound strange, but even though we vote differently, the, the beautiful thing about the city council and councilors at large is that even though we may not vote the same way on an issue, when that issue is over, we put it aside, we recognize that's democracy, and we go on to the next issue, and we try to evaluate what is in the best interest of the city, research, do our due diligence, and then vote on that issue. And I think when you have that kind of a relationship with people where, you know, you never hold a grudge because a vote didn't go your way or you think somebody is leaning one way and they go another. That doesn't matter. The bottom line for all of us is what's in the best interest of the city. So 
Uh, I'm genuinely glad to be here. I enjoy this. I think it's important to have face time with people. I also think it's very important not to just show up at election time and decide you're going to answer a few questions at a candidate's forum. So welcome to all of you for being here. And I know uh, in this case, I will speak for all four of us. We look forward to working for you during the next two years. Um, also, before, before Gene says something, I do want to recognize and on behalf of the council, we want to thank State Rep. Jerry Cassie, State Rep. Michelle Dubois for being here, and also former Ward uh, 7 Councilor and our former colleague, Chris McMillan. Thank you for being here tonight. Well, good evening. Um, I'm so happy to be here. And of course, like Moses just said, as you can see, I'm the youngest person um, on the council at large group. And I think it's an honor for me um, to be here with you. So my job is to work for you and to represent you. So I'm excited um, about this journey. Um, last November, uh, you guys voted for me and gave me an opportunity to serve. And I think it is my job to represent each and every single one of you. you know, it doesn't matter where you live in this city or what you do, but as long as I am your count I'm one of your council at large. I will vote according to what I think is best for all of us. So I'm here tonight to listen to you, um, to share ideas and stuff like that. So one of the things that I do as a new elected, I put my cell phone number on the business card. So the phone number that you see on the card is my cell phone number, which means you can call me at any time, leave me a voicemail. I will get the voicemail and I'll talk to you. So it is important for me to represent you, but also to talk to you. So it's, it's an honor for me to be here, and of course, like um, Councilor Farron said, all of us do believe in the city, and we don't take this for granted. So we truly appreciate the fact that you take the time this evening, the weather is pretty bad out there, to come and share your ideas, and we are more than happy to listen to what you have to say. Thank you so much. I got one more. Yeah, sure. Just, just before we get started, th this time of year is interesting for us because it's kind of the unknown. We don't know how much state aid we're going to receive for our schools. We don't know how much state aid we're going to receive for unrestricted general government aid. Brockton's budget is always heavily dependent upon the level of state aid we receive. We don't have the mayor's budget yet. We certainly wouldn't expect him to submit it in January or February. It will probably come into us in May. So we're kind of operating with some unknowns that directly bear on decisions that we will eventually make. Uh, the one thing that I always like to reaffirm so that people understand, the council can only approve the budget as submitted or reduce it. Unlike the legislature, we do not have the right to increase an appropriation. So even though we may see something that we wish were more fully funded, we can't do that. We can only accept what the mayor has submitted and approve it, or we can reduce it. And if we reduce it, we don't get to say where the reduction will go. So if you understand that budget process and you understand, again, how we're operating in the unknown, that's what, that's what kind of makes January through uh, March and April pretty interesting each fiscal year. So with that said, uh, I think we're going to sit down because we don't want to talk down to you. And uh, it's wide open, so open it up. Open we, it up. we also just want to um, go on record to thank Mike Thomas, the Assistant Superintendent of the Schools for the City of Brockton. Um, you know, this is vacation week. Uh, we reached out to Mike and said, you know, this is going to work for the four of us. Could you do it? He, he, he opened up tonight the cafeteria here at North. So thank you to the school department and, and Mike Thomas for, uh, for the work that he's done. <laughs> does, any, does anybody have any, any questions? It's not working, no, hold on a but it's working. It's working. It's working on the video. They're taping it live for cable, and it will be airing. Hello. There you go. Oh. Want well, to use this one or that one? You need this one, don't you? Put them together. Yeah. <laughs> Take two. There you go. Dennis Hersey, you, you had some questions. Please come forward if you could. Yes, please. Thank you for being here tonight. My name is Dennis Hersey. I'm a taxpayer and homeowner in the city of Brockton. Most of you already know me, city activist. Something has been going on that doesn't make sense as far as downtown Brockton goes. We have a gentleman by the name of Robert May. He's supposed to be revitalizing downtown Brockton. Yet the city, you know, 
it's mind-boggling that no movie theaters going in, no bowling alleys going in, no jazz clubs, no nice movie <laughs> movies, no nice clothing stores, no nice restaurants. The only thing that he's doing in downtown Brockton is putting low-income housing in. We need someone, and I'm hoping this, the city council puts him on the spot, we need to have industry coming into downtown Brockton. We need jobs. We need, we need entertainment coming into downtown Brockton. We just can't have low-income housing, low-income housing. He's got to do something more than that because it's absolutely ridiculous. The other thing is, is we're going to revitalize downtown Brockton. We used to have a city uh, right in the corner of Maine and Legion Parkway, a police officer in the booth. If you can remember that, some of you, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. It'd be nice if we had one there again. Also, maybe one on the corner of Main and Belmont Street right there on Crescent Street, another booth. When people see police officers, they feel safe. That's number one. Number two, I could take you gentlemen on a ride right now through Brockton or anybody here where downtown starts on Allen Street and Father Kenny Way all the way up to Spring Street, Warren Ave, to Montella Street, and show you 37 stoplights out. Now, come on. P if people don't feel safe, if they don't see police present, if they don't have those street lights on, they're going to have a fear to come down to Brockton. I know we do have to change the perception of the city because of all the violence. All right? And, and, and violence hasn't changed. It's still as bad as ever. We, we know the robberies are going on and everything else. Okay? We know we lack a good 20 police officers shot right now. But we need to do something to bring jobs into downtown Brockton, to bring businesses. And I just, I don't know why you people aren't putting some pressure on Robert May. And thank you. Do we, do we want to answer this or we just want to go on to the questions? Only because there's a resolve coming in. Okay. First, I'd like to send best wishes to Mr. Hersey's father. He's a Pearl Harbor survivor. He uh, was in the Army and stationed out in Hawaii on December 7, 1941. And I hope I'm not violating HIPAA, but he fell and fractured a couple of ribs, and he's in the hospital. So I'd, I'd like to send to Dennis. Uh, where did he go? You're hiding on? Oh, there you are, Dennis. I just want to send to your dad publicly best wishes from everybody, particularly for his service. So. Uh, Mr. May and Mr. Jenkins. Robert Jenkins is the executive director of the Brockton Redevelopment Authority. I have filed a resolve which has been read. It was referred to Finance Committee and either on the 5th or 19th of March, uh, those two gentlemen will be coming in to give us a briefing on the downtown. Uh, I do agree with what Mr. Hersey mentioned that any meaningful downtown development has to include a change in the public safety perception of downtown. I mean, I jokingly say, but I'm serious, most people don't get up on Monday and say, gee, honey, I can't wait to go to dinner down in Brockton at, at Center and Main Street somewhere. I mean, we, we're going to have to change what people see. And having visibility, having walking beats, hopefully in good weather, having bicycle patrols, uh, having someone stationed in a booth at, at Legion Parkway in Maine will certainly help. But uh, that discussion will be coming forth. And I hope that uh, those of you who can watch it at home, once the program is taped, that you will do that. And we can probe where we're going and how quickly we might see some meaningful changes in the downtown area. We do have the parking garage coming in. We're very pleased about that. But that's really only one piece of the puzzle to try to improve the downtown area. And it's going to take a real collective and collaborative effort to decide exactly what you want for your downtown area and what's reasonably attainable. Because every year that goes by, the price of what you might be planning to do goes up. So it's a real challenge. It, it really is. And uh, you know, we, we work together on it, and we'll, we'll stay on top of it. Dennis, that's, that's a great question. A um, couple things. Um, and, and Chris McMillan, when he was the counselor, can attest to this, because he was one of the, uh, the advocates. Um, the city of Brockton is definitely lacking a movie theater. Um, there's no really rhyme or reason why there isn't a movie theater in the city of Brockton. I mean, there's one in Braintree, um, there's, there's, there's one in Randolph. Um, but when, when Chris tried to get one to come back to the Westgate Mall up here in 7, um, there was two answers that we got in response, because I sat in on a meeting. Um, number one was crime. 
Um, but number two was that the days of the movie theater, and I don't necessarily agree with this, the days of the movie theater are gone with Netflix and, and Redbox and all that stuff. That's what we were told. Um, I, I do think that the city council was wise to adopt Chapter 40R, Smart Growth Zoning. Um, Michelle was on the council when we did that, and Chris was on the council. Um, it is a catalyst for development. Um, you know, I, I, I concur with you. I don't think residential housing is, is the linchpin for re redeveloping downtown. Um, but with that being said, we have been able, we the city have been able to capitalize financially relative to Chapter 40R with Trinity Financial, $30 million investment. Um, natural um, um, move to the old star market with Vincentes. They didn't close their original place. It's still there on, on Main Street. They did, a, I think it was an $8 million renovation uh, on that location. Um, the days of 1950s when my mom and dad worked at the Center Theater, those days are gone. The days when my grandmother worked at Fannie Farmers on Main Street, those days are gone. But I, I have to think that there's a way that we, we, meaning the elected officials and the mayor, can work together to try to attract businesses. We do have uh, the Chamber of Commerce, we have the Downtown Business Association, Campello and Montello, um, but I think there's a disconnect and I concur with you. I don't think we're getting exactly what we should be getting. Um, from Mr. May, and I do want to thank Wynn for putting that forward. And, you know, at the end of the day, the only thing we can do as city council, since we're the legislative branch, is to ask the questions. That gentleman doesn't report to us. We can't hire him. We can't fire him. Um, but we can ask the tough questions, and I know that we will. I, I always do, so I know we'll continue to do that. Thank you. No, I'm being the, I'm being the host. <laughs> well, that, that, that's a good job. So, well, Chris, thank you so much um, for that question. So, what I can tell you is that although Council File said it, like, you know, jokingly speaking, there's no place sort of like downtown to go and, and have fun. So, I'm going to tell you something pretty unique. I'm 27, and let's say that I would like to take somebody out on a date. I can tell you that I don't really see where I'm going to take them downtown. And I campaign on this one. So, for me, to be honest with you, I'm not really happy with what what May is doing in this city. You know why? Because um, Brockton is a city. I think we can do some more progressive stuff because the reason why when you have a place like Brockton, we call ourselves a city and then you go downtown. I mean, what do you see? I mean, of course, you got a couple of businesses and stuff like that, but after six o'clock, it's kind of like so dark down there and nobody want to go. So for me, I think this is unacceptable. I think we got to be able to sit down and come up with the best idea in terms of like how do we approach a system. I'm going to tell you something unique about Brockton. We have three train stop in the city. You got Montello, Brockton and Campbell. So what can we do to attract business people to actually come and build around them and hopefully push Brockton forward? And I think this is something that I personally cannot tell Rob me what to do, but I think collectively as a council we can call upon him and say, you know what, what have you been doing? Where you at and where do you want to go? Because that's your job and how do you plan to improve it? So for me personally, I'm not happy with what they've been doing. So I hope that all of us can come together and ask the tough questions for all of us because Brockton is a city that we have a solemn obligation, not just to live in this city, but to be part of the city. And when we are using our tax money to pay somebody to do their job, they should do their job regardless who's doing it. So I'm not paying you just to look good or smile. I'm paying you to do something important. So for me, I guess it's important to see someone like you come to those meetings and ask those kind of questions. Because if you don't ask, no one, el no one else may think about the importance of it. But the fact that you come tonight and ask it, I truly appreciate it. Thank you. I, um, before I pass the, mic the microphone around, and I, uh, again, it's been said before, there's no reason for me to repeat what the, what's already been said. But one of the things that we have become is a city of plans. You know, we have more plans than probably all the cities in the Commonwealth. We have a plan to decide when we can have another plan, to talk about the plan that we had, to see what, all, what our new plans we're going to come up with. Uh, to me, it's been very simple. From the get-go, we have tried everything in the city except two-way traffic on Main Street. And yet, we've talked about that ad, ad nauseum. Uh, I remember from the days with Harrington, we had come up with a study and we paid a ton of money to get those studies done. It was ready to go and uh, we're thrilled about the studies, but guess what? It was a study. Linda came in, God knows what happened with the study. Um, and now with the, with the new mayor, new studies are happening and we have become a, a, a city of plans. So if perhaps what we need to do is put our, all our plans together on the walls in downtown and the downtown will look so much better because we got plenty of plans. 
And, uh, and until such time that we decide that we're going to put these plans into action and take one small step, uh, it frustrates the, the daylights out of me because we want to we want to build, as the old saying goes, we want to build Rome in one day. Let's just try one afternoon and see what happens. You know, just to give that a shot, take it one step at a time, build something concrete, and let's move on. Because I am actually, frankly, tired of plants. You know, so you've heard. And I think, uh, Dennis, you mentioned something about lighting as well. Uh, I, I don't know if you noticed, but the city is a little brighter. Uh, the lights have been replaced. Uh, I, I just noticed that my street got done, the, the left side of the city, uh, got done uh, yesterday. So even my own street on Summer Street looks pretty bright. And it's being replaced, uh, you know, slowly because the weather hasn't really helped. But I think uh, when it's all set and done, you're going to notice the difference. A brighter city in the sense. And I hope that uh, you actually have gotten to see this. So it, it's going to happen. I know that there's still some lights out throughout the city, but we're encouraging citizens just to hang on because we were promised by uh, our commissioner that this process will take place uh, pretty soon. Do you want me to, uh, I think we just, um, uh, did I see Jack Lally? Jack Lally, uh, counselor from Ward 6 is here, uh, and Beauregard from 5, and I think our, the other uh, state rep, Claire Cronin just uh, showed up as well. Thank you for, thank you for coming. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, Deb. Speaking about plans. Oh Jesus. This is a process in place. Just before Deb, Deb says something, if if you have a, an issue with your street light, uh, as you may recall, the city acquired. They call them the Cobra lights, but every street light in the city of Brockton, Brockton owns now. It's our asset. We're not paying rent. You know, we saved over half a million dollars. It's reoccurring savings. Phase two was to then uh, install LED lights, and that's what Moses is saying. The 10-year warranty, those light bulbs are not going to have to be changed for 10 years. Um, there's an RFP. There is a, a, a subcontractor doing it. But at the end of the day, if you see a light that's out, you can notify any of the at-large counselors, your ward counselor, and the only thing we need, and many times I drive to do it, there's a little plate that's attached with a number to the pole. That's what the city needs to do to tell the contractor to go out and change the light. Um, but again, if, if you see something, let us know. But I, I know they are working to, to do the whole city of Brockton, and it is taking some time. Thank you. One second, Deb. I also see um, Alfred Did you really move from Senator Michael Brady's office. Um, just want to mention that. Welcome, Al. There you go, Deb. You have to hold two. Okay. Okay. And we're going to go out for dinners. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to come and speak before you tonight. My name is Deborah Garland, if no one knows me. I'm here representing the residents in a Butters of Walker's Playground. I know you said caller, but um, we're here tonight. Through the community discussions, a design was selected by the residents in April of 2017. At the conclusion of that meeting, we had selected the final design for Walker's Playground. The design was also featured in publications and newspapers as the final selection. In February of 2018, we learned that through Rob May, that there was an alternative plan for Walker's Playground, which no community involvement was requested. The flaws in the current design are the baseball field proposed is now a softball field with a removable fence. I don't know that you can remove a fence and play baseball after it's put there. There is now a soccer field that overlays the baseball field, which was not approved by the residents. The basketball court will not be removed to ease the disruption of the quality of life of the residents and neighbors. The parking lot will be left as it is, asphalt. It was supposed to be a new design for the kids. In speaking with the abutters, I learned that these points are very important for this neighborhood playground. And we have to remember it's a neighborhood playground. It may be a city asset, but it is a neighborhood playground. In closing, we ask that the original selected plan for Walker's Playground be adhered to. Thank you. Very much. 
Just very quickly, I went to all of the meetings uh, which were hosted by Councillor Azak and Deb was there and many others. I'll pass this around. This is actually a picture of what the playground was supposed to look like after it was constructed. It, it was featured prominently in the Patriot Ledger and in the Enterprise. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, here's my frustration with this. Um, if we enlist the public's help in determining a public policy issue, and we ask them to go up and put a number on, on the diagram that they think best suits that area, that's it, it's broken. <laughs> it, it, it just seems to me that, yes, you can have changes. You can find out that something can't be built just exactly the way you want it. But you should go back to the people. And, and, and we, you know, we, that's how we turn people off. That's how we make people feel like, well, no one really cares about us. And it frustrates me because we do care. And then we find about, out about it in a roundabout way. And then sometimes people will accuse us of not working with the mayor and not being cooperative, and, and that's not the case. It's tell us what's going on, tell us why you had to make the change, and go back to the people and to the venue where everyone showed up and everyone participated and make known that you've got to make those changes. And when that doesn't happen, I think that's why the residents are upset, and I, and I certainly don't agree with how this has been handled. So. The other thing is, I can't imagine a removable fence. Who's going to remove it? I mean, are we going to send the park department up there in overtime every time we need to remove the fence? If it's removable, I hate to say it, but someone could come in and say, you know, that makes great scrap metal. I'm going to take that fence, throw it in my pickup yeah. truck, and make off with it. The other thing is, in my younger and thinner days, which was so far long ago I don't remember, I actually played soccer. I can't imagine having a soccer team play in an outfield and chew up that outfield with cleats and then ruin it for the people who are playing baseball or softball. So this thing really needs to be well thought through. And I, you know, the four of us, we talk off the record and we're just looking for a greater level of accountability as to what goes on in the city. We're looking for a greater level of information sharing because it embarrasses me when someone calls and says, well, did you know they changed Walker Playground and they're not gonna do what they originally planned? And I say, I have no idea. And, and that's just totally embarrassing. So, and I'm sorry to go on about it, but if you ask people for help, go back and tell them if you've got to change the plan. I, I just want to take a second to uh, also introduce the uh, council president, the dean of our council, uh, Council Dennis Ionieri, who just uh, showed up in the back for more than three. Uh, hi, my name is Bob Port. I'm a Ward 6 resident, and I just want to remind everybody that uh, July 1st is fiscal year 2019, and that means in June the mayor's budget uh, services once again. They call it the mayor's budget, but most of us know who wrote the budget. But uh, usually, usually what it does, it includes a healthy tax increase. Uh, the, the author of the budget uh, also strongly recommends that uh, we go up a maximum on the tax rate. I, in fact, uh, when I got my last tax bill, I got a 30% bump in it. Plus, I got another 30% bump coming up the next quarter. But uh, I even filed for, for an abatement because it was declined. I, I expected that anyway. But, you know, unless you're well-connected. Uh, perfect example, a few years ago, uh, I think a 20, 2016 fiscal year, uh, I happened to bump into the former city ass assessor uh, about a week and a half ago, and uh, he told me the real reason why he was let go. I won't get, get into that right now, but but just to give you a, an idea of what happened, right after he, he let, let go, there's several millionaire, well-connected folks got huge tax abatements. I have a copy of it right here, and uh, there's just, just to the top ten of them, there's $317,000 worth of abatements. But, you know, God help you if you're a regular resident. You know, you can't get a dime off your taxes. And, and uh, but what I strongly recommend, too, is also when, when, the, when the budget uh, surfaces, you know, you, you, you folks on the council, you give them two or three days to, to look, look it over. And unless you're well-versed in finance, 
you know, you don't have a clue about half of what's going on in that thing. You know, de demand, demand that you get at least three or four weeks' notice to, to go over the budget, and, and even further, how about hiring an outside consultant to go over the budget with your person, Will Brift and Finance, maybe open up the city's books and see how much money we actually have in the city. Uh, uh, a good friend of mine, Dick Saccaro, he's, uh, I don't know if you know Dick, but he ran the state pension fund for 15 years. And he wrote a proposed budget about three years ago, and his budget would have saved the city $18 million. But uh, it fell on deaf ears. Nobody wanted to look at it. And uh, uh, another thing, too, we, we've got to, we've got to walk away from that Aquaria deal. We're, we're shelling out $7 million a year for absolutely nothing. And a lot of folks don't even know what's going on with, with that thing. My neighbor out the street a few months ago, we got talking about the Aquaria. Is oh, we can't touch that because that's where our water comes from. Couldn't be further th than the truth. But, uh, you know, I think so far the city dumped over $60 million on that thing. Imagine what we could do with $60 million. But, you know, that's all I have to say. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Ford. Um, Bob Ford comes to all our meetings. He gives us all information. Um, he's, he's, he's a good resident in the city of Brockton, so thank you for being here. Relative to having an independent audit, um, I've actually sat down uh, with the city a clerk, Mr. Zioli, and um, I'm chairman of the ordinance committee, um, and I've requested that we file an ordinance like the city of Quincy does. city of Quincy has um, a city council, former government like we do. They also have legislative council. They have an attorney. We have the same thing. We have an attorney, Attorney Resnick. But the city of Quincy also has a, an auditor, CPA, relative to the city council. So the city council in Quincy doesn't have to rely on the CFO. Um, we're going to do that here in the city of Brockton, but the only pushback is where we're going to get the money because the money is not the city council's budget. The money comes from the mayor's budget. So we need to work that, but I concur with you 100% on that. Um, in, in, in terms of um, just if I could quickly on Walker's Playground, um, I, I, I find it kind of humorous, quite honestly, that if anybody was at the inauguration, uh, the man that was sworn in to be mayor said that he made a promise this year to have open communication with the city council. We're going to be collaboration. That hasn't happened. That's a bunch of, that's a joke. Um, but what I will say, I think it's a poke in the eye um, to the residents when um, changes are made and the residents aren't made aware and the elected officials aren't made aware. So I don't think that's a dead issue at all. I, again, Shirley Azak's sick tonight. She can't be here. But there's 11 of us on the city council. And I know we're all going to really put the feet to the fire on that because that just, just wasn't right at all. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you, Council Rodriguez. And, oh, look at this, Councilor Derencourt and the uh, Councilor Sullivan and my buddy here. Yes, Councilor Farwell. Okay, this is just quick. A couple of things here. I always stress this, and I'm going to continue to stress this. You want to be part of the community. You can be part. You can serve on boards. There are many commissions and boards in the city with, what am I going to say, um, uh, they're missing individuals due, unfortunately, sometimes to their death. And of indi individuals, sometimes it's a resignation. People have changed, okay? They're all over the place. You have skills. You have talent. You can contribute. You submit a letter of interest and your resume. Nothing has to be, like, super involved or whatever, but I cannot emphasize this enough. And another positive note here, because Ward 5 is part of downtown, the best half, and um, I, uh, I want to let people know that there's a downtown Broughton Association meeting. Anyone can come to these, okay? 8.30, Wednesday morning, February 28th, 60 School Street. The reason I emphasize this is the speaker, the main speaker, is going to be talking about small businesses and different ang you know, uh, steps you can take to change the, um, what do I want to say, limited liability partnership, etc. All these other avenues you can find out, funding and whatever, to start your own business, grow your own business, etc. And that's the whole idea of this. And uh, again, anyone can come, 8.30, February 28th, that's Wednesday morning, and uh, we, we encourage people to attend various meetings in the city. They are open to the public. You're always invited. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Bill Hogan. I own the downtown Brockton Museum. I uh, just wanted to let you guys know, I think this is a great forum. 
um, that you have here. Um, it's a way of getting grassroots efforts to the city council. When we have the city council meetings, we don't have time to get up there and give us our ideas. I know you have to vote on, on things like that. I also want to warn you, I'm going to take full advantage of these forums, and you're going to get to know me pretty well. Um, you may not like me, but you're going to know who I am. Um, I want to get back to the Walker's Playground thing real quickly here. The, um, I really don't know where Walker's Playground, uh, the plan even came from in the beginning. And don't get mad at me, the people up here in Ward 7. I live in Ward 7 also. But how did the, how did the original plan even get started with a, with a soccer complex at Walker's Playground? Where did that come from? Uh, right. Now, believe it or not, Mr. <laughs> yes, Mr. Farwell used to be an athlete. I used to be an athlete, believe it or not. I'm an old one now. But I played at Walker's Playground for years, Pony League right through softball. And that was one of the most beautiful parks I ever saw. So I'm glad they're redoing it for you, but why did they come up with Walker's Playground? I don't understand it. Okay, just a question. <laughs> Secondly, I've gone to quite a few meetings where public input's been asked for, and I've never been to one that they actually did what the public put in. I have City Hall Plaza right here, and I own my businesses and right in front of it. These are the original plans. These are the plans that were voted on. And I know Mr. McMillan was there that night. I talked with you about it. And probably Mr. Sullivan. Um, these are the option one and two. We didn't get either one of those. <laughs> Neither one. And we did get the dumpster. <laughs> where I had plans to put a back entrance to be part of City Hall Plaza. You can't see it from here. But City Hall Plaza was supposed to be 80% grass and 20% concrete. It ended up the other way around, pretty close. I'm not going to go out and measure it, but it didn't end up the way they were supposed to. So back to the grassroots efforts. Um, when you go to somebody's house for dinner and he asks for your input and you want pizza, but he's already got spaghetti and meatballs on, you're going to get spaghetti and meatballs. So when we go to these public meetings, the city the city planner, it's his meeting. You can put all your input in you want. Guess what? They got plans. So we need the city council to hold the city planner and the mayor. I can't think of the word. What's the word for it? To the fire. <laughs> I was doing good up until that point. Um, also, uh, th that's, that's just facts. Those are all facts. It's not, a, not opinions. But uh, I'm trying to do some things, too. So now, on the other hand, if you're interested in coordinating grassroots efforts, you have to have a central location and a central, um, other than the government, to put these ideas to the government. Uh, Lenny Smith is one of the best in doing this. She didn't ask them if they wanted to do Keith Park over. She put Keith Park plan together and brought it to them. And they agreed with it. And they did it. Is she here? <laughs> no, I didn't know that, Lynn. <laughs> we, and there's other people that do that. But we'll never get anywhere if we're all doing this differently. You have to put it together, bring it to them. And they're the reasonable people. I have a couple of these people helping me out on some grass uh, root programs, um, projects. That leads me to my last thing, and I'll get out of the way. I am having a tourist presentation at the Brockton Public Library on Tuesday, March 13th. My idea is to make Brockton a major tourist destination. Not an afterthought, a major tourist destination. Um, we have Rock Stadium, we have Shaw Stadium, we have the Fuller Craft Museum, we have the, uh, the Firefighters Museum, the Historical Society, we have the Brockton Public Library, we have City Hall, we have a lot going for us. We have three um, railroad stations. I think you brought that up. We have um, three, major uh, three major routes north-south. We have Route 24. We have more going for us than any, any, anybody can imagine. I've already talked to the head of the Plymouth County Tourist um, Commission. He doesn't understand why Brockton isn't a tourist destination, especially with our history. So you're all invited. It's at the library, 3 to 7. KO will be there. He's always a big draw. Um, and uh, if you, if you want to come along, you'd be surprised. Um, what we have going for us. If you want to be part of it, I'm looking for help too, committee members. So thank you.
Good evening, everybody. My name is Julio Pomar. Um, I live here in the city. I grew up here in the city. I live in the east side. Oh, I'm sorry, by the village now. Um, I ran for mayor about a year ago. Obviously, I didn't win, but I'm planning to go further with that. Uh, just a little background on me. I'm a retired firefighter. I'm still an active duty paramedic. I work here in the city. A lot of my concerns are for public safety. That's just what I'm used to. It doesn't mean I don't have questions or concerns of other things as well. One of the big things I want to really address right now is actually just two departments that I'm, that I'm close to, the police department and the fire department. Um, they both do an amazing job. I was concerned with what I saw the language of the police contract. Um, the position as far as uh, the communications officer, civilian communications officer, I don't understand why you need somebody to be a communications officer, a civilian for a police department, which as a lieutenant or a captain or even a sergeant, this should be out there in, in mingling with the, with the citizens, citizenry. Excuse me. Uh, community policing was a big thing 20, 30 years ago and continues to be. I think when you take it, the job out of the people who are out in the streets and give it to somebody who might not have the training or might not know as much as a police officer or a, certainly a superior officer, I think there's a lot, there could be a breakdown of communication. I don't think that's warranted. I don't think that job should be warranted. And I want to uh, uh, applaud the, uh, the city councilors that voted against it. Um, my first, that was about the police department. No, about the fire department, uh, about a week and a half ago, they had a lapse in communications. They had a fire out in the middle of uh, Pleasant Street. What's the long-term goals for these departments to support the other departments? And I don't mean by giving them more money. More money, to a, a better paid police officer doesn't do a better job. More police officers do better jobs. I'd rather see the money go to officers who are out there. Let's increase the police officers by 10, 20 fold. So get them back to, their, back to where they should be the levels. Not give the police officers now more incentives to do their jobs. They shouldn't have incentives to do their jobs. It's the nature of the job. A firefighter doesn't get paid extra money because he puts out a fire every day. He doesn't get paid extra money because he goes on medicals all the time and then he gets a fire so he gets a little bit extra money for a fire. Has us do it to pay for police officers? You're a police officer. It's, it's nature's your job. Let's get more of them out there. Let's stop paying the guys who are there more money and more money as they walk out the door. We need more guys on the street. That's what it comes down to. Opening up the street, uh, Main Street to both two ways. If we don't stop the crime, no one's going to put the street, no one's going to put anything in the street. What's the sense of having traffic going two ways up, up and down Main Street if there's nothing there and all you see is just more and more crime? I don't want people now, instead of going up Main Street, heading north and seeing all the needles and the derelicts and the people who are, have no place else to go, now you're going to open up the two ways and you're going to see them going up and going north and going south. Let's clean that up. You brought up a good question. When I was, I joined the Navy in 1984. And when I joined, my parents took me over to a restaurant called Joseph's right in the middle of Main Street. It was, wasn't a high-priced place, but it was great. It was a place where everybody went. I'd love to see something like that again. That's where we should be looking at, bringing, uh, bringing more business into the city. Um, my question is, again, for you guys, what is your long-term goals for the public safety of the fire department as well as the police department? I'd like to know what it is. I will address that too. Did you want to say something? No, I would just, he just caught my attention. No, no. So. And then we'll, we'll do it. Okay. My name is Josette Cochran Lusk. I've lived here since 1989. I have attended more meetings, more planning groups, held signs, helped politicians, um, gone to PAC mm -hmm. meetings than I can even keep track of. And I walk around, a year ago I was here, and I said, are we going to get our crosswalks relined, at least in front of the schools? I was told at that time, oh, when the weather's better, we'll, we, we have a program, we'll do it. Wasn't done, as far as I can see, wasn't done. Ride my bike around through DW Field Park, potholes everywhere. Walk through the Raymond School parking lot, potholes everywhere. Drive your car through Brockton High School parking lot. It's a minefield. I look around in this cafeteria. The doors are worn. 
There's uh, a vent system over there that's rotting and decaying. I, I have a question because I've come to these meetings and I get told these things and this is going to get looked into and that's going to get looked into. There's four of you here. I want four good reasons, different reasons, why I shouldn't sell my house and get out of this city. Four reasons. <laughs> Sorry, I'm angry. <laughs> first one first and then I, we'll, we'll, I was going to say you, uh, you no, no, I'll give her my <laughs> I, I, I understand uh, yes. okay I, I, I'd like to answer hers first you have an award-winning school system I will put the Brockton Public Schools up against any other school system in terms of what is available to our children if you pay attention if you do the work, if the parents interact with the faculty and staff, you can go on to Annapolis, West Point. A friend of mine's daughter went to the Coast Guard Academy. We've had people go to Ivy League schools. So number one, I would say that if you live in the city and you have children or grandchildren, you will have an opportunity for them to get a first class public education. Number two, I do think, notwithstanding the problems that we face, and some of them drive us crazy, you live in a community that is easily accessible to the capital city of Massachusetts, Boston. There are job opportunities in and around that area. We wish there were more here in Brockton. So that would be my second, my second uh, point that I would emphasize. The third one is, believe it or not, you can get a lot of house. My daughter just and her uh, fiance just bought a house in Brockton. And you can get a lot of house for not a lot of money. If they had purchased the same house that they have on Pondview Circle in the town of Easton, it probably would have been $100,000 more. They're in a lovely little quiet area. There's a pond, there's wildlife, there's anything imaginable. So I share your frustration, but I think it comes down to this, and we, we talked about this during the campaign. There isn't a level of accountability in this city for how the different departments function. I don't think there's enough accountability on the mayor, and I, I was in the mayor's office for four years. I'll, I'll admit that, that the council has to hold whomever is the mayor accountable for the different issues that are important in this city. One of the things we do, which I think is a mistake, is we go through the budget, and you mentioned this, I think, last year. The department heads come in, well, I want $22 million. well, I want $17 million. I want $15 million. We give it to them. They walk out of there, they've got their budget that starts July 1st and ends the next June 30th, and as far as they're concerned, don't call me, I'll call you. And so maybe it's time that we consider holding back a little bit of the budget and having some performance indicators you know, in business, I think they call it the KPIs, key performance indicators. Maybe we should have that in government and say, oh, you want $20 million? I tell you what, I'm going to give you 15. I'll give you three quarters of what you want. You prove to me you know how to handle that three quarters of the amount that's needed. Show me what you accomplish with that and then come back to us and we'll appropriate the remainder. Now they're going to holler and they're going to squirm and they're going to say, oh my God, I can't possibly plan my next fiscal year unless I have all of the funding. You know what? They do it in business all the time. They'll say to a division manager, here's some money. Show us what you're going to do and then come back and you can have more. Now getting back to the police, uh, having retired from the police department, uh, they need to be held more accountable. I, I, the reason I don't like that position, other than wasting the money, the $90,000 for a public relations communications person is, that's the officer's job. When we were out on the street, police community relations was every time I knocked on a door, every time I stopped a car, that was police community relations. How you treated that person, the impression you left with that person, is going to cement in them their opinion of the police department and what it's all about. So this, this nonsense about creating a position for someone that we all know is who it's going to go to. I mean, it's, it's, you want to talk about politics. Sometimes I just have to go home and hold my nose and I say, this thing stinks. Is that, is that position guaranteed forever or as long as you have? It's in the union. He put it in the union. That's, if this is a million, I could be in the union. 
Oh no, he they negotiated with not the police union in a different union. And that's what bothered me. If you if if the mayor somehow thinks that he needs a police communications person, a media person, number one, he has Peter Zimber on staff who does communications. But number two, put the person on mayor's staff so that when the mayor leaves, which we all do at some point, you're not stuck with that position. But by putting it in the union, by the time the mayor leaves, this person will have tenure, and that position could go on ad infinitum forever. And the next chief and the next mayor will be saddled with that person. So I think it all comes down, and I'm not trying to be trite, I think it comes down to the A word, accountability. You know, we have to do our job better. And it isn't a question of being mean to the mayor, and it isn't a question of not getting along with him, and it's not a question of not having a good relationship with him. It's how government is supposed to function. You send the money in, the mayor recommends an appropriation, we approve it, and so we should hold the people accountable who are spending that money. And, and I mean in a professional way. Be uniform and consistent and say, show me what you're going to do with the money, what are the key performance indicators we want for all of our different departments? I know mine is be more customer friendly. I, I, I'm not happy with some of the stories I hear about people interacting with city staff, but um, I think that's our job. I don't know if anyone disagrees, agrees, but I'll, I'll pass it on to whomever. Uh, well, first of all, I, I would plead for you not to move out of the city of Brockton. And I can tell you why I'm in the city of Brockton. Right over there, my three kids. Um, my wife and I had ample opportunity to move out of the city of Brockton. We could have went to Easton, hang them. We could have went anywhere. But we didn't. This is home. I think the number one asset of the city of Brockton is, is the people. And I've said this before. I mean, if Brockton was a stock, you, you would buy it. Because at the end of the day, you peel back the layers. It's the right, really the right community for me. And I suspect it's the right community for you. Now, all the, oh, thank you. All, I mean, all the, all the, all the, 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 you know, shenanigans. I was going to use a different word, but my kids are here. All the shenanigans of politics, and if you get along, you don't get along. At the end of the day, at least the way I was raised, you do the right thing. You do, you do the right thing. You, you, you know, you're not always going to agree with people, but at the end of the day, you look in the mirror. If you did the right thing. There's no issue. So to get back to what Julio was saying, um, you know, I, I, I voted in favor of the contract because of collective bargaining. I'm a lawyer. I understand none of us here, unfortunately, are able to negotiate. It's only the mayor and his staff to sit down with the union president or, or, or assignees to negotiate it. But in my day job, I have sat at the table, and, and it's give and take, and you fight. But one thing about Mayor Carpenter is he knew that the city council, at least last legislative session, I can't speak for Gene and I, I, can't, I can't speak for Suna Castro, they weren't there, we were against that proposal. It's a farce, it's a joke, it's 90 grand, it's a payback, it's a political patronage. It's not needed. <laughs> but, but I also think that if you look at the way collective bargaining was done with the firefighters and the, the officers, the patrolmen, and now the supervisors, this case law, it's parity. I mean, I, unfortunately, that's the way the process is. But that 90,000 job, and I asked Carpenter when he came before us, I said, are you going to hire Darren Duarte? I asked him right there at Finance Committee. And he said, well, I, you know, he'll, he's a good candidate. You know, I hope he applies. I have nothing bad to say about Darren, but I do have something bad to say if there's a job already set up for someone. That's just not right, and that's not what taxpayers, I'm a taxpayer. I might be a city councilor for 12 years, but I'm a taxpayer, and my wife's a taxpayer. We work hard to do that, but Brockton's home. And, and when you see these shenanigans or these things being done that just are not right, they need to stop. And I don't know when it's going to stop. I mean, people get reelected, and yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> But what, what I will say is I, I can honestly look at each and every one of the people that came here tonight or anybody that calls me, and my cell phone's been on there as well forever. I can honestly say that you just you, you go to City Hall, you do your due diligence, you vet it out. You know, Moses and I always haven't agreed, Gene and I, you know, Wynn and I. But at the end of the day, we all are trying to make Brockton a better place to live and work. And if I didn't like Brockton, I wouldn't be raising my three kids here in the City of Champions. So I'm asking you, I hope you consider staying in the City of Brockton. Thank you.
Well, I would like to thank you for asking that question. I'm going to tell you why I think you shouldn't move out of Brockton. Um, in our city, we have an excellent educational system. I believe one of the top in the state. So I am part of this. You know why? Because I went through it. So for me, knowing that we have an amazing educational system where our children can learn, not just learn, but learn from the best, I think it gives you a reason to stay in this city. And also, Brockton is a great place. Look at the diversity in this city. We are one of the most diverse cities in Massachusetts. So I think, for me personally, as a Haitian-American kid, diversity is important to me. Because you know what? It allows me to understand where someone else is coming from. The word is, it allows me to empathize with other people. So I think the educational system, the diversity, our public transportation, I will not say that it's great, but I think it's good. The bus system that we have in this city. And of course, you are the people. You folks are truly the reason why nobody should move out. You know why? Because I was talking to a wonderful woman earlier. She said she's been in Brockton for over 20 years. You give me a reason to stay in this city, to have a family in this city. Although I am new, I've been here for seven years, but you know what? Brockton is my home, and I love this city, and that's why I chose to engage into the political life. But if we're going to talk about the issues, let's be real. When it's come down to public safety, I'm going to talk to you now. I think we have a perception problem in this city. Because you know why? I mean, although we do have crimes, but it's not as bad as we talk about it, folks. It's not as bad as we see it on the media. You know why? Because if you go on the FBI website, take a look at the data, I do data analysis, the number has gone down. But the perception has not changed. I'm going to tell you a quick story. When I went to Massachusetts Community College, I was part of the student trustee. I went to Worcester. There was a bunch of kids introducing themselves they asked him, where are you from? So when you said, I'm from this place and that place. They asked me where I'm from, and I said, I'm from Brockton. One of the students said, how come you're not wearing a bulletproof vest? At that time, I was like, OK, what do you mean by me wearing a bulletproof vest? According to that statement was that in order for me to live in Brockton, I have to have a bulletproof vest. I think this was a wrong perception about this city. You know why? Because that's not true. Some of you have been living in this city for the past 20 years, 10 years, 15 years, until we as Brocktonians has the courage to change that perception, trust me, people will always believe in it. I mean, you live in this city. You know this city is not just take a gun and shoot people. That's not true. We have to make other people understand that what you are seeing on the news and what you are hearing is not true. The perception, it's a big issue. Believe it or not, I'm going to tell you the truth because the crime has gone down. You may not accept it because you just want me to tell you what you want to do, but I'm not going to do that. In terms of the contract, I voted for it. I'm going to tell you why I voted for it. When it's come down to decided this contract, we don't have any power to determine what's going on. And there's, I'm not a lawyer, but there's something called arbitration. Let's face it, we voted against it, and the mayor took it to arbitration. The mayor gonna say, I don't have any problem with the contract. The union gonna say, they don't have any contract with the, they don't have any problem with the contract. And you know why? If the mayor doesn't have any issue, and the union doesn't have any issue, they're gonna go for it. So for me, it's not just talking about that $90,000 thing. It's not true. It is understand the complexity of the situation and how long it will take them to actually move on. And I said it to you, I voted for it. And I'm going to tell you something about communication. I've done a lot of research about this position. You know why? Because so many cities out there do have that position. Because sometimes people are more likely to talk to a civilian than talking to a cop. They feel more comfortable, folks. Don't get me wrong, I do believe that he or she should have some knowledge about the communal justice system, law enforcement, to understand the complexity of the people that they are, they, are, they are dealing with. And that person should be qualified and able to use the information and put it out there. But I'm not going to just stand here and telling you that I'm against it and stuff. No, I voted for it. Because you know what? I think now is the moment for us to move on, not to move backward. Because we need somebody who is able to take the information from the police department bringing to the people and from the people bringing back to the police department. This is what you need. You're talking about moving on. We have to make tough decisions, folks. And you know what? I will use my vote based on what you want me to do. I'm not going to just stand here and telling you something to make you feel good. We do need somebody that can actually do that job. But do I know who's going to get it? I don't know. I don't care. As long as that person is qualified, I think he or she should get it. But here's what I said. I would hope Whomever gets a job is a bilingual person, somebody who is able to speak at least another language. I don't care what kind of language. This person can speak Greek and whatever. But I would like to see somebody who is able to speak another language, and hopefully that person will be able to empathize. 
We need a wonderful decision. We cannot move on with the same decision that we've been making over and over again, folks. We have to make tough choices, and this city needs to move on. And that's what I'll do for you. <clears throat> sure. Yeah, hold on. I mean, I agree. You know, I I agree with what you said, but you know what? As a council, not just I, we don't have any power to hire. We don't. I cannot tell you whether or not I'm going to ask them. We cannot hire. That this is, and, and, and I believe one of you guys asked the, I mean, I agree with you 100%. I would like to see this. I am with you on that one. You know, um, honestly, I'm one of these guys that, uh, and I'm going to come back to you for, in a second. I'm one of these guys that voted against it in finance and then a week later voted for it at the council meeting. And I'm going to explain my reason because I noticed when I, when I did that you were looking at me like, that's you. That's you, Fawa. Uh, but one of the things that I, uh, and I, I, I agree with you. The issue, I don't actually have an issue with the position. You know what I have an issue with? Is the how. Is the how. Because the intent is great. What's wrong with having somebody in the police department that addresses the community, works with the community? So as long as that position is open to the city, and that's one of the issues that I actually had, and I actually went to the union to figure out whether or not we would actually have an opportunity to, once the person is hired, since he or she will be a department head, whether or not we would have the opportunity as a council to, um, to basically approve the position like we do for the other department heads. And we found out that we couldn't do that because that's not the language that exists in the contract. The reason why I went from not supporting it to kind of supporting it, it's exactly what the, what's been addressed here earlier today. We don't negotiate the, the contracts. We don't sit at the contract table. We have absolutely zero say in what goes on on a negotiation. I have a major problem with the way contracts are negotiated in the city. I honestly feel that we are negotiating contracts like we are Newton or Wesley or some of these other rich communities that exist out there, where we are just, you know, with all due respect to our folks that work very hard in the school system, very hard in the police and fire department, but there will be times when we can't afford to give somebody a raise. There's people in this country working 10 years, 20 years without a contract. If the community cannot afford a contract, we should not give people raises. We got to be realistic. But unfortunately, the way the contracts are negotiated and the people sitting at the table negotiating these contracts, they're taking that away from us. And what they did on this particular contract with the supervisors union, it's basically they agreed on the contract to give whatever they wanted to give to the, to the union and then left it up to us to be the bad guys to decide whether or not we're going to go yes on the money or no on the money, when they know for a fact, and that's actually the advice I got from somebody when I said, I'm still going to vote against this thing. And someone said to me, you know, you're wasting your time because your CFO basically think this is the best contract ever agreed upon. <laughs> your mayor thinks that this is the best contract ever agreed up, uh, on. When they do go to arbitration, when they go, go to arbitration, and that's basically what, uh, what Gene was saying, the mayor thinks it's a great contract, the CFO thinks it's a great contract, and the union doesn't have an issue with the contract, they're going to go around and vote for it. So one of the things that I was hoping that this contract actually had addressed that I saw as a problem in the police department 
is the lack of police supervision in the police department. There's days and nights in this community that we have one patrolling sergeant in the streets of Brockton. One. So the issue I had was in the contract, when they were talking about the contract, I actually even approached some folks and said, can we put in the contract additional sergeants to help in the patrol in this city? Oh, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. And voila, when the contract showed up, there was nothing to do. I found out that the union didn't want that because it, they wanted more police captains and that since the mayor couldn't agree with the police captains, they decided they weren't gonna put any supervisors in the contract. So basically what I did, I traded my yes vote for a promise of the union supporting some additional supervisors. And that's what I made it very clear the night of the, of the vote, that I was at least given word that the police union, the supervisors union, would support uh, an order that we put in to increase the number of sergeants in the streets of Brockton. Because, again, it was either vote no, goes to arbitration and it becomes law anyways, or at least hold them hostage for a little bit in hopes that we are able to get something in return. And that what... That's what I did. I basically voted in hopes that I could get some police, uh, some police supervision. Now, going back to Brockton, uh, in terms of uh, your, uh, your concerns, um, Gene said, you know, he's been here seven years and that he's spoken to some people who've been here 20 years. I've been here 40 something years. That's your problem. You know, some of us have been here 50 years, 60 years, you know. But the issue is that this is our home, you know? And I'm glad Bob brought his kids with him because this is our home. People forget that we, although we're sitting up here acting like we know what we're saying, when we don't, really, we're also citizens of this city. We're taxpayers. You know, it's interesting that when we're discussing um, the tax increases, uh, people make it sound like we don't pay taxes. Maybe the rest, nobody's ever told me that I don't have to, I pay taxes up the yin yang, you know? Uh, so as a taxpayer, I don't want to see my taxes go up. Not like you do. You know, so it's up to all of us to stand together and make those calls that we can to make sure we hold it down. But as far as the city is concerned, I think one of the things that we also sometimes take for granted is the fact that, you know, Brockton is a city. It's a city surrounded by a ton of little communities. It's actually interesting if you look at it, statistically, you grab Stoughton, Easton, uh, West Bridgewater, East Bridgewater, Whitman, Abington, Holbrook, and Avon, and you put them all together, it does not equate the population of Brockton. Avon fits inside, population-wise, inside of our high school. There's more children at Brockton High than they are people living in Avon. We need to understand that when you have a major center in the middle of nowhere surrounded by a ton of little communities, yes, we are gonna have some problems. Yes, we're gonna have some problems, but there's some issues that we, we ourselves need to do something to promote our community. I went to a conference not too long ago where a, uh, I, made a, I made a remark that there were no gangs in Brockton. I made a remark, you know, there's a bunch of cliques and gang wannabe kids in our community, but we don't have the gangs like the cities of New York, Chicago, LA, and some of the other communities. There was a police officer there, one of our own police officer, that came to me and said, you're wrong about this. There are gangs in Brockton. We know who they are, we know where they are, and we know what they're doing. You know what I said to him? Thank you for proving to me that there are no gangs in Brockton. Because when I last checked, gang activity was illegal. So if you know who they are, you know where they are and what they're doing, why are they still doing it? And that's what happens, is exactly what happens in our community all the time. We are our worst enemies. We, Brocktonians, are our worst enemies. We let people come from the outside of the community talking a lot of nonsense about our community.
forgetting to talk about the fact that, you know, our boys just won a soccer championship not too long ago. That our, our freshman high school football team went undefeated. Our basketball team is doing as well it's doing. You know, it's important for us to do the clapping because no one else is doing it for us. So if we, in turn, turn around and decide not to clap for our, own, for our own city and our own people, we will continue to have the negative perception that exists about our city. Yes, we have problems. Yes, there's crime in Brockton. Yes, there's some serious issues going on in Brockton. But it's also, a lot of times, us. They're not doing a very good job in promoting the good that happens in this community. And I hope that we are all, that all of us that are here together, that we can kind of come together and start promoting this, because if we don't do it, nobody else is going to do it for us. Our newspaper isn't going to do it for us. I'm glad our cable station at least is here covering some of these things that we're doing in the community. Where is the, uh, where is the newspaper? They're not here because, you know what? This is not, it doesn't bleed. It doesn't lead. You know, but it's important for us that are sitting here to continue promoting the good that happens in this community because it's that important. I'm, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes on the, on the police issue because having worked down at 7 Commercial Street for so many years, obviously that department is, is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I don't really object to the position of having a media community outreach person. To me, it was a question of priorities. We need more police. The police need newer cruisers. We need new radios. Even in our own family life, we have to look at the revenues coming in and we have to set priorities. So in a perfect world, if we had all of the officers we needed and they had great cruisers that didn't have 160,000 miles on them and we had radios that had been modernized so that you can actually talk to the surrounding towns and, and notify them of a particular incident going on, maybe that position would be fine. But you have to look at what's proposed versus what are the revenues. Now, there's no one here, with, with due respect to my colleagues and even the mayor, who has had any state mediation experience. I did with two unions when I became mayor back in the 90s. I had mediation with the teachers and I had mediation with the firefighters. There is absolutely no way that this police department contract, police superior officers contract, would have gotten any traction in mediation or in arbitration when the chief financial officer himself put in writing, I will only certify that we can afford this through June 30th, 2018. After that, I do not know if it will have a negative impact on the city. So I was sitting there faced with the question of, are we going to lay off teachers? Are we going to eliminate programs and services in the schools? Are we going to have other issues that come up that are going to be competing for constrained revenue? And I made a decision that I just could not go along with it. And the last thing I would say is, unfortunately, we had that tragedy down in Florida where school kids were, were killed. If we have excess funds, I'd like to put it into examining school security, maybe a radio system for our schools. But the other thing you'll notice is you didn't see a civilian standing at that microphone explaining what had gone on and what the police had been doing and what they will do. You saw a uniformed officer. That's how you build trust. I agree with Councilor Derenencourt. There are people who are afraid of police. I, I understand that. Particularly minority people are afraid of the police. And that's tragic because 90% of what you do in the police department is helping people. It's not what you see on TV with shoot them up, slap the cuffs on, and take them to jail. You're out there, you're trying to interact with people and gain their trust. And when you need them and there is a serious crime, then you go back to them and say, hey, can you help me out? And if you've built that level of trust as a uniformed officer, they'll help you out. So I happen to respect every vote that all of the counselors took. There were only three of us that voted against it, and that's fine. If I had been the only one that voted against it, that's fine. Because you know what? The only person I really have to live with is me. As long as I can look in the mirror and I'm comfortable in the morning and I know that I did what I was sent to the council to do, I'm fine with that. I don't care if it's a 10 to 1 vote. 
And I just could not in good conscience vote to go forward with that contract knowing that the CFO had warned us about the potential impact, again potential because we don't know yet, after July 1st, 2018. And uh, you know, we will go forward. We'll, your original question was, what is the long-term plan for the police and fire? Now, Councillor Sullivan's been here for 12 years, going on 13. I don't know if there is a long-range plan, a three to five year strategic plan. I do know that people retire. I do know, I do know that they replace. The more build about the infrastructure of both departments. Yeah, no, and, and that's a very valid question. We lurch forward in this city year to year. That's the problem. And when I say lurch, it's because there's so many unknown factors. But I've never seen, of all the reports that have been generated by this city, and as we all know, they're warming shelves at City Hall, I've never seen one for a strategic plan for the infrastructure of the police and fire. I, I think it should be done. It absolutely should be done. I mean, what is, the, what is the rate of cruiser replacement? What is the rate of fire department equipment replacement? What is the rate of replacing the personal equipment that firefighters have to use, and I, I don't, I have no idea. And again, that's, you know what, that's probably our fault. We should file a resolve and ask for that information and have someone come in, and that goes back to the level of accountability that I think we need to establish in this city. I, I think every department has a, I think, <coughs> excuse me, I think every department has a wish list of what they would like, but they need to share that, because you just can't say, on your fourth year, oh, five years ago we thought about this and now we've got to come up with it because the stations are falling down. When I ran for mayor, I spoke to the, uh, Mike Williams who's the fire chief. He, was a, he runs a very, very nice, professional, lean department. And his, one of his biggest fears was station in, on North Main, a station in Campello, and even a station on, on, on Pleasant Street. Should something happen to one of those stations and somebody say, okay, well, you can't use this building anymore because it's so antiquated. Where am I going to put my crews? How is that going to affect the citizenry? How is that going to affect our response times? It's something that needs to be dealt with. It's not, at least have an idea or a vision where you want this to go. Because the fire department, I mean, police department, public safety, all these services, they're not going to go away. We're still going to need them 5, 10, 15, 20, 50 years from now. And we need to prepare to where they're going to be and where we're going to house them at the very least. How are you? I just wanted to uh, to chime in on the uh, the union contract as well. It's a popular subject. Um, with Councillor Rodriguez, uh, I was the other councillor that voted no in then yes, uh, and I also wanted to express my logic with that as well. Um, at the at the at the very beginning, at the very beginning, uh, you know, from the start, I did intend to vote yes on the actual contract. I voted no in finance committee because that's a simple recommendation that has no weight behind it, but it does sort of, it gets people talking. It shakes things up. Councillor Rodriguez had, you know, a, 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 similar, a similar goal. People say, okay, what needs to be done? I voted no because I wanted those, both parties to go back and say, okay, we have a real concern. What if this doesn't go through? What can we do to what can we what can we fix what can we uh, what can we mess with in the next week? But I fully intended to vote yes in the council for the simple matter of arbitration. If we went to arbitration with that council, they would have sat not the city council. They would have sat the union and the mayor in the same room and said, "Do you have a problem with this contract? Do you have a problem with this contract?" And both both would have said no and we would have spent tens of thousands of dollars added on top of what we're already blowing away in the, in the contract on that. Truth be told, I really don't see the need for a communications person. I think it should be somebody in a uniform answering these questions. Um, in terms of, and I, I looked at that job description in, in, those, in those committee meetings, before those committee meetings, most of that can be done by an intern managing a Twitter. I manage a Twitter. You know, if you can, if you can tell me I could get some credits out of that, that'd be great. You know, put stuff on YouTube. There's, there's, that, that could be done with a couple of interns 
the school would pay for the interns, the, the, the city would be out nothing. It's, it's not a, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a good financial move. It was sneaky to put in. But fact of the yeah, matter you is... You have a recourse, though. Once it's in, you just, you, you either vote in all of it or you vote it down. Yes, yes. You and can't nitpick it, or, as the mayor said. You can yes, that was, that was our, our object. We objected to that, but there's no, we, we could not cut that from the contract. And that's the problem. That's why we felt it was, that's why we felt it was sneaky another mayor would have to negotiate to take that out. But until that, that's, that's about it. And that's the problem. We need to make sure that everything's, everything's up in the forefront. Did the, did the city request anything from this union? Did they say, okay, you guys got what you wanted, but we want, what do we get? Drug testing. Drug testing. Um, I'm not sure. Some Somebody drug, else. Some drug testing. Some drug. Yes, not the not the full thing. Yeah, well, that's that's part of the that's that's part of the part of the whole problem is I don't believe that that was a position the union wanted in the first place. Which means, in order for the city to get that in the contract, the city did have to negotiate and put other things in the contract that the city might not have wanted to see go into that contract so that's even that, that that's an additional problem not only was it something that you know we really don't want it was something that we also had to give other things up to get and that's you know i'll i'll, I'll give it back to that i just wanted to you know make that known as well because i know this i know people have you know been concerned about it thank you Yeah, but we can't hear you, sir. Step up to the mic. Yeah, I'll get you right up. Good evening. Um, as a former counselor here uh, for eight years, it's got to be a point right now where these contracts come in front of the council. It's a joke because they know that you'll never vote against the city. Uh, you, know, you know, vote against it. You have to stand up one of these times and shoot, shoot across the bow and say, we're not going to have this contract that's not good for the residents, and let's, let's go back to negotiations and find out what's going on. We're not going to approve the final money. It stops with you guys. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I mean, just saying that, you keep on saying, it's not us. We didn't negotiate the contract. But you guys had the final say in awarding the contracts. So you guys have to actually stand up and say, it's not, I don't care if it's going to go back to arbitration. Let it run its course. I was a union steward. Let the arbitration cost it. The unions have to pay half. The city has to pay half. But somewhere down the line, you guys have to actually stand up and say, we don't have the money. This contract, you might think as a CFO that it's the greatest contract in the world. But we don't have the money. So if you guys stood up and stuck together, all 11 of you, and said, I'm sorry, you know, this is not going to happen you know, this time, you know, tonight, then it's fine. You know, let's, let it run, let's run its course. You're not anti-union. I am definitely not anti-union. But it's a time and place where you guys have to say, <clears throat> we, didn't, we didn't negotiate the contract. We had to prove it. But no, you can say no. You can say no once. And that would set the precedent of saying, we, and no, no contract is completely guaranteed. Every time they come in front of you guys, they don't have respect for the council. Do you, am I right? You think they have respect? These department heads have respect for you guys? No. Absolutely, some of them don't do Some, come on, guys. I've been there, I know. Bob, you might be coming back. Yeah, I will. I will. But listen, I mean, I'm just saying, though, you guys got to stand up and say no once in a while. You know, you can't just keep on rubber stamping this, saying it's this, it's, it's this fault, it's this guy's fault, it's the CFO's fault. You guys have to ask to stand up. You know, and another thing, too, you guys, um, back when Trinity, just a jump subject right now, back when Trinity Financial came down, down downtown, they had two phases, and the third phase was 
They guaranteed $100 million to redo that whole big block, which included the parking garage. All financing was set. Now they're gone. And now the state's put, kicked in the money, which is our money, actually. And now we're stuck with a half, a half a block done, and Trinity's just sitting there doing nothing. So that's just, that's just for the new counselors, that, that was brought in front of us years ago from Trinity Financial. That was their pitch. They said, we got $100 million. We're going to redo the whole enterprise uh, block. And you were there, Moses, you know, as, as in, in Harrington's office. And that we're going to do this, you know, give you guys all this, and you guys have to just give us the parking lot, and we'll make that into a, a garage. Now they're gone. So where's the accountability? I don't know. I mean, you guys have to actually talk to them or talk to somebody, say, what's going on? Why are we spending this much money on this, this block? And, w and like you said, Moises, plans. You got plans on top of plans on top of plans, but you have zero action. You know, the, re the restaurants are beautiful down there. We've been saying two-way traffic since we've been on Har you, you with Harrington, but it's not happening right now. But the problem is, guys, you have to stay, you have to stay together. As a council, all 11 of you, you have to actually stay together, stand together, and then make, make, your, make your, your, your voices heard. You're our voices. Don't just sit there on, at the desk and say, it's out of our control. Stand together. You know, talk to each other, you know, you know here and there. But, I mean, not, not no more than five. <laughs> because it's against the open meeting law. But um, you guys got to talk, together, talk and stand together. You have to stand up to this, this, the, the city, uh, all these contracts. We're, we're getting killed here. These contracts, I mean, it's great for the fire department, the police, and all that. They're making tons of money. And they're the overtime. The overtime back when I was a city council for the police department, 450000 And they did it. They, they stayed within the budget. 1.3 right now, 1.2 million right now. Okay? As far as st statistics, uh, statistics go, <coughs> excuse me, about, you know, if you, if you go in with the FBI, from the, for crime, that's voluntary. So you could tell the FBI that crime is down 2%, crime is down 3%, and they don't back check. You know, that's, whatever you tell them is what they feel is, is true. But I'm just saying though, you know, crime is probably down nationwide, or at least this, 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 this uh, but it's a, it's a circle. It's a vicious circle, up and down. Sorry, guys. Hold on a second. Let me get this poor kid who's... Well, Chris, I just wanted to, I just wanted to add, and I'm not, not saying this because my colleagues are sitting here, but I think you actually have, at least in, uh, in, in quite some time, a group of counselors that actually are trying to very hard to hold people accountable. Uh, we've got some things in the works I think that you'll be pretty impressed with. In a, in a way, in, in terms of accountability. But just the mere fact that we held off, we held this contract up. Now remember, they had agreed with 16 other unions. This was the last one that needed to be done, as the 17th. So the fact that we basically held this contract up and make the, the hoopla that we did about the contract itself, I think it goes to show that some of us are pretty fed up with this stuff. And one of the questions that kept coming up on that evening was, when will this stop? When is it going to stop? Because it's, it's, it's actually out of control, and we know that for a fact. And it's like I was saying earlier, we can't keep doing this because, again, that's why we can't get new, new uh, cruises. We can't get a new station. We can't get a new anything because everything that comes in goes for personnel. And it goes for personnel in a way that, as it has been done in the past, and that's what's causing the issues in our community. But I think, I think what we did um, the last couple Mondays, I think is the beginning of that, you know, enough is enough type of thing. And I think the contracts that, that to come, at least if I'm around, let me put it to you this way, if I'm around, we're going to go through the same thing again. Because, again, we're not sitting at the table negotiating the contracts, and... When we, we can't really, it's almost like when you go to, you go to, you lose a case in court, 
And the judge says to you, well, you can appeal, but you cannot go and testify on your behalf. You cannot go and defend yourself, but your lawyer thinks you're guilty, and I'm going to be the same judge sitting here judging you. Because that's exactly what would have happened with this contract. Because we didn't have much of a say, because there was nobody to argue on behalf of the citizens to defend the contract in arbitration. Let me just take, take, take it, this yeah. young guy and then I'll pass. Thank you. I'm Adam. Um, I'm 23 years old. Um, I've lived in Brockton for, well, in my house for about 12 years this October. I live on Walnut Street. Everyone knows Walnut Street as the prostitution zone. Spring Street, uh, Walnut Street, Haverhill, Turner, Pleasant Street, it's known for its prostitution. And I was told recently by, in a meeting with my ward councilman and an officer, that this area is the heart of prostitution. And all of these prostitution, uh, prostitutes are drug addicts too. They, mo majority of them, if you look on their arrests from the news, they are not residents of Brockton. This needs to be handled because myself, my brother, he is 15 years old. He should not be looking out, outside and see all these prostitutes. The neighborhood kids, there's over 30 of them. Hardly any of them want to play outside because their parents, well, their parents don't want them to play outside because these prostitutes are out there selling themselves just to get their drugs. People from other facilities, they put them in taxis, send them here to Brockton. The police need to be held accountable for this. Yes, this past uh, fall into winter, in 2017, they did crack down on it. But you know what? The cops stopped coming back to our neighborhood. And you know what? The prostitutes, they're filling it. They're pimps, they're out there doing their board meetings like the councilmen do their meetings in their offices. They go out there, stand in the street, do their, do their little counts. Oh, you know what? We'll have this prostitute on this, in front of this house, in front of this house, at this corner. The prostitutes say to our neighbors, oh, this is my street. Get out of here. They shoot up in front of the kids. My mom does family child care. We're, we're lucky to even, she's lucky to stay in business because the parents feel safe enough to have them in our house, in, in, our, neighbor, in our, our yard. But you know what? We actually did lose a daycare family because her father, when she had him come pick up her, his grandson, her, his grandchild, a neighborhood, uh, neighborhood, um, person that likes to watch out for, for the neighborhood and the kids. I have my suspicions of who it was. And you know what? I'm, I'm angry that he did it because it lost uh, money from my mom. But you know what? He has the right idea of getting rid of these Johns, but he got the wrong person because this guy, he was not a John. He was going there to pick up his grandkid. He had never been to our house. and. He asked some lady that was walking down the street, who was a prostitute, and asked her, where can I find this house, which was my house. And the neighbor, he saw, he ran outside, banging on, the wind, on his window, yelling at him, don't talk to the prostitute, don't pick up the prostitute. Ended up ripping off his door handle and threw it at him. And you know what? It's getting ridiculous. We need these prostitutes out of our neighborhood. These cops need to actually do their job. They need to pull people over, make money for our city. Because if we don't give tickets to people, where are we getting money? And then this, this $900,000 uh, transfer, that could have hired 20 cops, 20 cops. And you guys, I mean, there were some people that said no. But you know what, the rest, they could have also said no and then put the negotiations for more cops because the cops say, oh, we're tired, but they're also allowed to get overtime and overtime and we're not getting any more cops. And these people are overworked. We need a solution to actually 
help our city. We're, we're, over, we're almost 100,000 people, and how many cops do we have? Less than 1,000, maybe less than 500? I mean, we, we need more police, and if they actually pull people over and give tickets, maybe we can afford a new cruiser. Maybe we can afford to hire more cops with the money that they bring into the city from pulling criminals over, from breaking the speed limit, soliciting themselves. I don't know. We need to find a solution. I mean, if, if the cops aren't going to arrest these prostitutes, why not just make it legal? Because they're just going to do it anyways. We can just tax payer money. We're paying to get rid of these people from our neighborhoods, and it's not being done. We need a solution. I, I, I know we're going to close in a minute, but thank you, Adam. Uh, I think this particular topic we ought to bring up at our next meeting because that it's we have community policing. I think we need to go back to Neighborhood Crime Watch. And for those of you who have time, go on the Internet and go to the City of Springfield, Massachusetts Police Department and take a look at how they have broken down their community into sectors. And they have ranking officers and they have patrol officers who go out and patrol that community together and they actually have weekly meetings and they give you the date and the time that the meeting will be held. That, to me, is the essence of community policing and neighborhood crime watch. Uh, Adam, I will talk, uh, well, we, we will talk to uh, Councilor Monaghan about your remarks tonight and we will follow up and I thank you. Well, they just got another $275,000 in overtime, so I hope somebody gets out there and does something or, again, accountability. So, uh, no. um, yes, to put some emphasis on what Councillor Fangio said, I think we definitely need to get on top of this, and I think it's an unfortunate. Um, I'm so sorry the fact that you have to go through this in your city, but I hope that you know, we can do something um, very soon about it. Moses? Yeah, that's something we can check into. Uh, uh, Bob, did you? Oh, Lynn? Hi, I'm Lynn Smith. I just wanted to bring up a couple of um, things for you to go home and think about that's good news. Mm -hmm. So the Keith Park Neighborhood Association came up, the park that we did in Campello, and every year we do an Easter egg hunt. So mark your calendars for March 31st and bring your kids. It's a fun event, it's a free event, and the kids have a great time because we use the parks to build community. The other thing we talked about was getting good news out about Brockton. And on uh, April 12th, we're part of the Douglas Bicentennial. You know, Frederick Douglass was born 200 years ago. And we're having an event on April 12th. And the newsletter that went out across the United States and across the world with the list of calendar events, Washington, D.C. was listed. Baltimore, Maryland was listed. New York City was listed. Brockton, Massachusetts was listed. And Paris, France was listed. So we're getting positive news out. So April 12th is the other day. We have to be the sales force for the city of Brockton. We have to say that this city is great, that we love this city, that we are tough, we are resilient. And I've been here since 1985, and I just got my discharge of mortgage. So I'll invite you all to the paper. I am debt free. <laughs> Congratulations on that, Lynn. So, so before we, uh, we close it out, I, I, I just, I, Chris McMillan's a good friend of mine. He's a good buddy of mine and, and we, we kid each other, but I, I just want to be clear on one thing. I can tell you in the last election, city election, there was four individuals that were targeted to get knocked out of local politics. Me, Dennis Cianeri, Moses Rodriguez, and Wynn Fowler. That's a fact. The powers that be wanted us gone because we do not rubber stamp things. So make that clear that you are represented well by people that work for the right reasons. Please remember that at all times. Um, I, I, I have to say this was without question, and nothing 
out of respect for Shayna Bonds, our colleague, our former colleague, but this was the probably the best Counselor Lodge quarterly meeting we've ever had. It was it was it was passion, there was great dialogue, great questions. We don't have all the answers, but this is what the whole purpose is. This is why the four of us wanted to have this. We have three more scheduled for this year. I want to see more people at the next one. Uh, and my, my kids might not be there because they're tired. But I, I just want to say this from the bottom of my heart on behalf of Gene. Mosed and Winthrop, we want to thank you. It is an honor and a privilege to work with you and for you as your counselors at large. I want to thank um, Claire. I want to thank Jerry. I want to thank Al. I want to thank Michelle for being here. Uh, Ann Beauregard, uh, Jack Lally, of course, the president of Tennessee and Erie, Mr. Macmillan. I just want to thank everybody for being here, uh, and we will be seeing you again at the next quarterly meeting. But thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you.